Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, coming to you six days a week as we interview whitetail experts and hear their traditions and personal stories of the hunt. Learn more about the latest gear, discover proven tips, and the latest strategies so you can make your next hunt a success. Now, here's your host, Bruce Hutchin. This is Whitetail Rendezvous Podcast, episode number 290. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin, and we're going to meet with Sean Greathouse out of Colorado today. Sean is a global hunter, archery hunter. He's traveled all the way to Australia to get an Asian uh, water buffalo. The thing he's most uh, proud of is he's got the Colorado Big 8 species, and he's working on the Super 10. What the Super 10 is, a.k.a. the poor man slam for archers, he, and he only lacks a mood, so he's working really hard to get that done. Hey, listeners, don't forget to text 33444 Food Plot for your free Food Plot ebook. Welcome to another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous. This is your host, Bruce Hutchin. And hey, folks, uh, you know I'm from Colorado, and I'm going to stay in Colorado today because uh, Sean Greathouse is a great DIY hunter. He's on the quest for the Super 10. He's going to tell us what that's all about. But, Sean, um, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, glad to be here. I appreciate you taking time to talk to me this morning. Yeah, in the warm up, we talked about a lot of different things and and just help the listeners realize that they can uh, do do it yourself hunts if, if they want. Um, figure it out to ask a lot of questions and three get in shape so for my listeners all across north america that are whitetail hunters help them understand what it takes to be one a diy diy hunter in the uh in the mountains well it's, it's probably not a lot different than what they're they're already doing in their local you know demographics um but basically, uh, the first thing is to, to get the license. And, um, you know, I guess it all starts with figuring out what you want to hunt and then doing a little bit of research in terms of um, figuring out where your draws are the best. There's a lot of areas that are over the counter. And uh, out west, it's not like in the east where everything's private. You might have a few walk-in areas in the, in the east or, you know, small blocks of public ground that are probably felt like they're overhunted. Um, in the West, we've got thousands and thousands and thousands of acres, uh, you know, in Colorado and Wyoming and Montana, and there's just vast amounts of public ground. Um, they are getting a little bit more populated with hunters, but there are still, um, you know, Boone and Crockett, Pope and Young, there's, there's areas that just, you know, are meccas with wildlife. And, um, so if you put, if, if you start doing a little bit of research and um, figuring out kind of what state you want to hunt, um, there's some really good, most of the time, over-the-counter areas that you don't have to wait years and years and years to hunt. Um, you can get in and hunt right away, and that's one thing. I, I go up to Idaho almost every year on an elk hunt that's an over-the-counter unit, and I feel like that's as good a unit or better than a lot of the trophy draw units uh, in Colorado. And um, so I'll travel every season to go hunt elk in Idaho as a non-resident because I feel it's as good or better than Colorado. Um, so there's there's areas out there like that, and it doesn't have to take a lot of time to draw that tag. Um, so that's the first place I start. And then... Um, now, you're archery you know, hunting are, only, correct? I don't want to in- interrupt, but I want the listeners to know, you're archery hunting only. That That is correct. I, I started out uh, as a rifle hunter, and I think when I was 21, I discovered uh, the bow and the arrow and have hooked, been hooked ever since. Um, that's, that's our passion. That's my family's passion. That's what we do, um, whether it's archery tournaments or hunting. 
Um, and so, yeah, I'm strictly bow hunting now. Now, that's not to say that I won't go out and, you know, hunt coyotes, you know, predator hunt or, uh, you know, go water or uplands bird hunting or something like that. You know, I still enjoy that as well. But uh, as far as big game is concerned, I just soon do it with a bow. And I don't have any issues or problems with, with people, you know, using rifles or, or whatever. That's, you know, it, it's hunting. And we're all we're all in this together, so to speak. So, But, yes, I am strictly archery. And uh, just I just love watching that arrow fly. And that's something, something about it. <laughs> and thanks for that. Say, um, if you were sitting in Wisconsin saying, you know, gee, what's the first hunt I do? And let's just stay in Colorado. I can do an antelope hunt. I can do uh, a mule deer hunt. I can do an elk hunt. Um, draw the tag and, and and go hunting. So, what what would you recommend? Well, if I was. Uh, if I was a guy in Wisconsin, um, or a gal, we took to say, "Hey, or a gal." <laughs> right? You know, uh, everybody wants to come out here and hunt elk, and uh, you know, I would say Colorado has the most elk of any other state. You know, according to Game and Fish, and we've also got. Uh, you know, some of the most public ground, um, that might be something that I would start with because there's a lot of units that have a lot of elk. Are you going to necessarily kill a Pope and young elk your first time out? Mm, maybe not, but there's a good chance that, uh, that you, you should have opportunities. You know, I'll leave it at that. And depending on, on how hard you hunt and, um, how, how much perseverance you have, I think, is really the key. Um, I, I, I feel like uh, 90% of the game is killed, at least archery-wise, 90% of the game is killed by 10% of the hunters. And it's those same 10% hunters that are successful every year um, or most often and, and I think it's just because of the mindset that they have so if you come out and you're willing to put in the work and get up you know before before light every day and you know not sleep in and and do all the things that you're supposed to do you know play the wind and, and just and just be methodical and consistent you're going to at least have opportunities uh at, at a bare minimum um that that might mean moving to a different part of the unit if you aren't getting into elk and sign but you're going to get into some game and uh so I, I think that's the biggest key is I, I think it's a bit unrealistic to say I'm going to go out west and I'm going to hunt elk and I'm going to go kill an elk and there's one around every tree. That's not the case. But if you go out into it knowing, hey, I'm going to have to work, but if I if I give it my all and I work, I'm at least going to have opportunities. You know, I, uh, that's not to say you're going to kill anything, but you're going to – you're going to have opportunities. And uh, the more time you do that, the more perseverance you have, eventually, you know, you start putting yourself in situations where you're going to um, connect with, with, with game out west. So. And one thing I tell people, Wyoming is probably the easiest place to get a uh, antelope tag, plus they have probably the most antelope in uh, North America, as far as I know. And then right. mule deer, mule deer are tougher and tougher. I know Colorado, every single deer um, for mule deer, you've got to put in for tag. But I noticed in your bio, uh, Sean, that you've killed some pretty decent um, bucks with the largest grossing uh, 196. Must have been a mature deer. Tell us about those uh, whitetail bucks that you're hunting. So, so yeah, that's that's the other thing. If, if I was in Wisconsin, uh, here, it's kind of kind of funny because I get to Kansas almost every year to hunt whitetail. I unfortunately didn't draw this year, and this year has been a little bit of a crazy rut as long as it's been. But uh, you know, I I always go to Kansas thinking that's where the big the big whitetail bucks are. I mean, I know there's a few other states, Buffalo County, Wisconsin, and, and some of these areas are, you know, brew some big ones. But uh, uh, eastern Colorado has been good to me, and specifically eastern Colorado public ground has been good. Now it's getting harder to draw a tag out there because of how good it's been. But um, we've had, I've had a lot of success, um, again, using those same principles, being prepared, being persistent, and, and working hard, getting into big bucks in eastern Colorado, whitetail bucks specifically, um, here in my home state. And uh, 
it's kind of crazy because I've, I've, I've enjoyed hunting waterfowl and that's kind of how I stumbled onto a couple of these areas along river bottoms and stuff and and found some pretty good bucks kind of in the off season when I've been hunting ducks or um, other things but uh, um, yeah I've, I've been, definitely been fortunate enough to take some nice ones and to do it in several different methods um, you know spot and stock whitetail hunting that's something you don't hear a whole lot about um, in some of the corn rows and, and milo fields and things like that out here um, you'd almost feel like you're hunting pheasants rather than, than deer um, but uh, it's, been, it's been kind of fun and that's what makes it uh, enjoyable, just figuring out the different demographics and that there's there's deer to be found in, in all these different ways. You can hunt them in different methods. And, of course, I've killed them out of tree stands and, and uh, spot and stock. But, yeah. What do you find the most challenging thing about a whitetail buck? You know, they are... Is that I don't know what it is about the whitetail buck. You know, I used to think uh, whitetail was one of the last species. In, in Colorado, we have 10 different big game animals that you can hunt. And I've been fortunate enough to kill eight of the 10. I can't seem to draw tags for the other two. But whitetail was the seventh of the eight that I killed. And everybody, especially some of the guys from out east, used to tell me how much smarter a whitetail was than a muley. And for the most part, I think that's that's probably true. At the time, I, I argued and I, I, I disagreed with them until I actually started hunting them hard. And uh, I think, you know, we see all these smaller whitetail bucks. Um, I think there are a lot, there can be a lot like smaller mule deer bucks. Um, but when it comes to a big, mature whitetail buck, um, they've got to be one of the most keen big game animals on the planet, um, just in, in how smart they are. And um, just this, oh, a year ago, just watching watching a buck, big buck come in, and right, you know, we came in, I'm real careful when I go into my stand or my area not to touch any uh, weeds or uh, fences or anything, but, well, there was an area where I had to step over a fence and I had to push it down, and that buck come in, and it went, I mean, of course, I'm wearing gloves, rubber rubber gloves, so I'm trying to do as much as I can with my scent to, to mitigate that as possible, and... You know, still, he comes right into that point, was coming in, had the wind right, everything was right, smelled where we had crossed the fence, myself, and um, I had a camera guy along with me, and right at that point, he stopped, you know, you could tell he was smelling, and he turned around, and we never saw him again, so... They're just, they're just keen, you know, whether it's the hearing, the, you know, people talk about that sixth sense, and uh, I don't know how much there is to that. I've toyed around, they've got, they make the hex suits, which is supposed to um, block your electromagnetic energy that your heart puts out and stuff. They talk about, you know, there might be something to that, I don't know, but they are definitely in tune with their surroundings, that's for sure. Well said. And um, now the largest deer you've taken, was that a Kansas buck or was that a um, eastern Colorado? No, that, 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 that was the eastern Colorado. I, it, it, kind of a strange story. The uh, I, I was able to connect on a Kansas buck four days earlier that went 188. And um, so, you know, that was pretty, I was on cloud nine coming back to Colorado. I had a, a white tail tag in my pocket for eastern Colorado. So I came back from Kansas, got the deer all taken care of, processed, and one thing and another, spent a night with the family. And then I went back to get in the stand um, in eastern Colorado. And uh, I was on public ground. And this is what where that persistence starts to pay off. Um, it was a new walk-in area that was opened that year. So not a lot of people knew about it. Um, but there was enough people that knew about it. And I pull into the little parking lot area, and there's three other trucks there. And this walk-in area is not that big of a piece of ground. It might be, I don't know, maybe 400 acres total. But there's several different parking or parking areas. And this particular parking area had three other trucks. And 
I I go out to the little area that I had scouted earlier in the season and and uh, climbed up the tree, a little climber tree, climb, or climber tree stand. Climbed climbed up into my tree, got all situated well before you know first light. And as the as the morning starting to you know as the sun started to come into play, I, I I'm able to glass across and it's really open in Colorado. The the river bottoms. Um, aren't like some of the areas back east. You can see a long ways. And I was able to look and a couple hundred yards uh, to the one side of me, I see another hunter in a tree. And um, not much was happening. I, I uh, rattled in actually a small mule deer buck that came right under my stand. And that mule deer, you know, I, I took pictures of it and that sort of thing. That mule deer wandered over to that other hunter that was in that tree stand. Well, this was about noon, and this guy climbed down out of the stand, didn't see this other deer coming in. Well, this mule deer, being a small muley, was curious. He wasn't sure what, what was the commotion was over there, so he kind of went over there to, to that other hunter and was just kind of looking at him, wondering, what what is this? And the, the hunter picks up his pack and picks up his bow after he got down out of the tree. He turns around and he sees this mule deer standing there looking at him probably 30 yards away. And he gets an arrow and he draws and shoots the deer and the deer runs off. And it, it was a less than perfect shot. It runs by my stand. I tried stopping it and the deer just went. And it was a non, non-lethal hit. And so the guy, 15 minutes later, starts walking through the woods, and I whistled at him and said, hey, uh, trying to be polite, I I don't think you're going to recover that deer, and um, I didn't, I I really believe he wasn't going to recover that, and I didn't want him messing my hunt up, walking through the woods, so he's like, okay, okay, and he went back, he grabbed his tree stand, he pulled his tree stand down, and he walked back towards the trucks, and I'm like, great, I got this, this area all to myself now. And so that was right around noon when all this took place. And a little bit uh, of time went by, and then I see him out creeping through the woods on the other side of me looking for his deer. And I just, it, it took everything I had not to get down out of the tree and go home. But I thought, all right, I'm going to sit here. I promised myself I'm going to sit here from dark to dark. And so I I sat there, and of course it was peak, peak time for the rut, so anything could happen. And about 3.30, I see him go back to the truck and leave. And about 4.30, I see a buck coming through, literally went 10, 15 yards from the guy's tree that he was in, come through, work its way over to within range of me, following some does. And I thought it was just a nice 140 class whitetail. Um, ended up shooting him. And when I, when I actually put my hands on him, he grossed 196 and change. <laughs> so that's that was public ground. That was an example of, you know, just being patient, staying in the tree and being persistent and not leaving. Had I had I stormed out of there mad, uh I wouldn't have shot that buck. So And listen, uh, I'll, I'll throw this out you. I have hunted um a lot of um public hunting areas uh, both for geese and ducks and pheasants and um uh, white tail or two and what I found is if you can get in there on a pinch point on a funnel um, someplace where you, you kind of move the odds in your favor whatever right. topography you know uh, river cliffs whatever it's the topography and it creates that pinch point or funnel then just commit just like Sean did said okay I'm going to go there especially during the rut and I'm going to go there I'm going to camp out I'm going to bring my lunch my you know my pillow so I yep. go to sleep whatever you need to do and doesn't matter yep. what happens if a guy's 50 yards from you doesn't matter because he'll quit before you will if you commit right. dawn to dusk and just sit there okay. because once that guy uh, start bopping around and, and moving through the brush that really didn't ruin Sean's hunt, especially during the rut. Because right. if he steered something up, the buck, they want to be where the ladies are. And as you heard <laughs> Sean said, he was trailing some does. So wherever the ladies are, so just think of this, the guys out there in a the marsh or, or some cover busts some does and they make a loop. They make a circle because they want that cover. They really do. And if, yep. if he doesn't shoot at them or yell at them, you know, they're going to get up. They're going to make a circle sometimes, and they'll come right back to that area. Guess what? They're leaving scent in a 360 degrees and just happen 
that this said um, – Possibly were some does that did get kicked out, came under his tree. The buck was looking, and bucks when they're looking, especially in in, in riverbeds or, or or ponds or or marshes or lakes, you know, they only have a certain place they can go, and that's part of the scouting thing. And once you figure that out, you got to get there, and you just hang in, and it's hard. Yeah, it's hard sitting from from dawn to dusk. It, it, <laughs> that, it is. That you're, it is. You're absolutely right. You, you've always heard the the saying. In most cases, you you, you can't kill it eating lunch at the lodge. <laughs> you can't kill it from the truck. You know, most of the time. You know, you're you, you know, so stay stay in stay in there, hang in there, and even if you got to, you know, if you're out elk hunting in the west, I know a lot of guys that. You know, they'll go back to camp midday, and, you know, a lot of times I'll just hang out and take a nap and wait the the part of the day out where stuff's not moving. So I'm up there in them or above them or, or where, whatever the case may be, wherever I need to be ready for that evening hunt. And there's a lot to say, there's just a lot to say about that. Say, um, what did you hunt in Australia? Uh, switch it up, and, and, and Sean's been in, yeah. um able to go some places that you and I haven't listeners, maybe some of the listeners have, but talked about Australia bow hunting. Is that any different than the U S it is. There's a lot of differences about Australia and, and, um, hunting. Um, one of the unique things is in most cases. So, so first of all, you can't hunt game that is native species to Australia. So, um, they do give out some permits to some of the locals and stuff for, you know, management type stuff. But generally speaking, you or I can't go over there and we can't go just shoot a kangaroo. I mean, uh, but you can go over there and you can hunt all the feral game. So, you know, they've got all kinds of different, you know, feral hogs. They've got camels. If you wanted to go hunt a camel, I don't know why you would, but uh, they've got... Um, Asiatic water buffalo are not native to Australia. They were brought over from Indonesia. And that is kind of the pinnacle animal to hunt in Australia. Um, and uh, along as well as many goats and wild cattle and all kinds of different feral games. Uh, it's, and it's kind of, you know, they say Alaska is kind of the last frontier hunting wise. And it's got the big areas of untouched, you know, masses of game and, and, and very hard to access and very few people. Um, Australia is a lot like the same way in, in parts of Australia. And, uh, I, I specifically went to the Northern territory, uh, twice to the first time I went over as a camera guy for one of my buddies and, and actually was able to hunt. He filled his tag and I was then able to hunt. And, um, then I went back to, to hunt again and there are no licenses required. Um, there are no limits, um, in most cases, so if you wanted to go over there and hunt, I mean, it kind of, there, there are some places that are getting a little bit more organized now um, where they're offering packages and, and different things. But um, again, uh, if you go over there and, and hunt, it's a whole different mindset. And um, one of the kind of funny stories that I saw is they've got the different international bow hunting magazines and, uh, I was over there and I picked up, I think it was South Pacific Bow Hunter magazine. I was flipping through it. And there's a guy in there with a picture of a feral cat. And a feral cat is basically a house cat. <laughs> so they're over there hunting house cats as, and they're, and they're completely wild. Same thing as a house cat here in the United States. But I thought to myself, if we if we had pictures of feral cats in our bow hunting magazines, man, we would have a hard time with the you know the anti hunting folks. Uh, it just kind of struck me struck me a little funny. But uh, it, it's a whole different mindset and opportunity. Of course, it the second time I went over, I went over on a do it yourself hunt. And we were on um, yeah, Aboriginal uh, ground. It's Arnhem ground, which is uh, one of the Aboriginal tribes, or if you will. And what was kind of cool about that is it's like hunting Indian reservations here. The, the Aboriginals make the rules as to what you can hunt and what you can't hunt. And so 
meaning we could hunt native species if we so choose, um, and uh, which would mean like wallabies and you know crocodiles and things like that. We had their permission to hunt that. Now we didn't really focus our energy on that, but we we were you know our goal was the Asiatic water buffalo, and, and uh, it's just really unique getting to see that different culture and the different wildlife that's there and you know figuring out what's unique about that game and how to hunt that that particular game that's that's part that's what makes hunting so fun and that's what makes colorado so great is we've got 10 different big game species that you've got to figure out what works for each game you know hunting whitetails is different than hunting sheep or goats or um so that that's uh, Australia is kind of what I would consider the last frontier of hunting. Um, Africa is pretty commercialized, from what I understand. I've never been there, but Australia is still a little unorganized, and they don't have all the the rules, and and it's not as popular um, going to Australia as it would be booking a hunt to Africa. So, um, a lot a lot of fun. Sean, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, what's the best way to reach out to you and say, you know? I want to talk to you more about Australia bow hunting or, or Eastern Colorado whitetails. How, how best would they do that? Um, probably the best way would be to email me at um, sean at hamskyarchery.com um, or give us a call at Hamsky Archery um, Solutions. That's, I'm a, a co-owner of that company, and uh, it's fun to I have folks calling in all the time talking, you know, whether it's tournament uh, competition or uh, bow hunting. So that's probably the best place to reach me. Now, are you, <clears throat> pardon me, are you on Twitter, Instagram, Facebook? Uh, Facebook, yeah. I can, uh, Sean Greathouse on Facebook. Um, I don't, I've got an Instagram account, but <laughs> I don't, I don't do much with it. Okay, that's great. Um, Sean, I'm at, at a break point. Do you have another half an hour? Because we haven't even talked about the three things you're passionate about. We haven't talked about your goat hunt this year. Do you have another half an hour? I do. Hey, folks, stay tuned for part two with Sean Greathouse. He's going to go more in depth about how he's hunting those 196 whitetails out in eastern Colorado and a few other uh, tips for you whitetail hunters out in the Midwest that are thinking to come out west. He's got some great ideas, so listen up. Thanks for joining us. Be sure to tune in tomorrow for another episode of Whitetail Rendezvous, where you can listen and learn from the experts so you can be more successful on your next hunt. Until next time, listen, learn, and succeed.